You know, as you look around, as you even drive throughout the community and drive throughout the city, and for some of you, even as you drive to this building, there are certainly a lot of different church buildings around that have a whole lot of different names on them and have a whole lot of different backgrounds. And if you begin trying to investigate and look at all of them, and if you were to go back in, uh, in the old, old days when we used to have those things called yellow pages and uh, flip through some of those and try to investigate some of those, I don't know about you, but it would just seem to be kind of confusing to kind of wade through all of the various groups that there are and their different teachings and practices and to try to figure out just what's the right direction to go. So as we begin thinking about this topic tonight and thinking about the, the fact that our religious world is divided today and that just like there's a CVS or a Walgreens on every different corner, seems like there's a different church or a different denomination in every different corner and trying to figure out where's the right place to go? What's the right place to, what's the right thing to do? It can sometimes be kind of confusing. Back in January, we presented a lesson on a Sunday night and talked about 10 reasons, 10 biblical reasons why I don't know that I could join a Roman Catholic denomination based upon what the Bible teaches next to what the Roman Catholics teach. And that was not intended, as we said that night, to be unkind or to be unfair or to call anyone out or make anybody feel uncomfortable. But after that night and after that lesson and after some discussions with others, I want to do a few more of these, but not on a regular basis. It's been four months since that one, and I don't know how long it might be until we might do another one. But I think we need to investigate. Not to be mean, not to point any fingers, but just to investigate what's happening in our religious world and to compare that with what does the Bible say. And so tonight what I want us to do is to look at, very briefly, we're not going to spend a lot of time on this, ten biblical reasons that I cannot join the Lutheran denomination. And I don't know if we have anybody here tonight or anybody watching online or anybody who will watch this video later who's a part of the Lutheran church that has that in their background or even currently is a part of the Lutheran church. But as you look at our religious world and, and the division that exists in our religious world, it's not a whole lot unlike what was read to us tonight from 1 Corinthians chapter 1 where Paul heard a report from Corinth that said, there are some of you who are saying, I am of Apollos, I am of Paul, I am of Cephas, I am of Christ, various ones claiming to follow different ones. That was 2,000 years ago. And I don't know that our world today doesn't look a whole lot like it did back then. And so tonight, I just want us to open our Bibles and to do some investigation. I have been praying about this lesson all week. I have been praying about this lesson all day today. All during this worship, I've been praying about this to make sure and asking God to help me to make sure that my attitude is right. To make sure that I don't get in the way. Make sure that I don't come across in a way that can be anything interpreted to be arrogant or to be a know-it-all, or to be some kind of person who's looking down on others. I don't want that at all. But I think it would be right of us to look at what's happening around us and just examine it from the standpoint of God's Word. So as we begin this tonight, I would like you to bow with me, and let's pray together. Our Holy Father, we are here tonight to study your Word together. That is our sole focus at this point in our worship assembly. And Father, I pray that you will help me to have a right attitude, to have a right spirit, to not be unkind, to be unfair, to be arrogant in any way. Father, help us to be honest. Help us to be biblical. Help us to be humble. 
in our approach to your word. And help us after this lesson to examine your word to see if that's what it really says. And if it really is what it says, Father, help us to put it into practice in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As you begin to examine the Lutheran denomination and look at its history and try to examine it next to the Word of God, there's no way for us to do this in a short period of time and to cover it in depth at all. And I'm going to try to just kind of do this superficially. There are obviously going to be 10 biblical reasons on the screen, and there's going to be a whole lot of scriptures that we just don't have time to look at. And there's no way for me to even talk about everything that will be on the screen. All of this will be on the website later uh, this week if you want to capture it later on. Uh, But hopefully it will be beneficial to us to just look at this in a cursory way, maybe to encourage you to look at it more in depth on your own. But is there any biblical reason why I should not be a part of a Lutheran church. Reason number one. So I think you have to look at the origin of this church. You've got to look at where the Lutheran church started. You know, the Lutheran church is actually the oldest of the Protestant denominations. It did not say it's the oldest of the denominations. That would not be an accurate statement. But it is the oldest of the Protestant, the denominations that protested Protestant against the Catholic Church. It is the oldest of those, but it did not exist before the 16th century. In fact, it did not exist before 1517, when there was a Roman Catholic monk, a priest by the name of Martin Luther, who had become upset with the Roman Catholic Church. And on October 31st, 1517, perhaps you've heard about the fact that he had written 95 theses by 95 things that he had identified about the Roman Catholic Church that he was not satisfied with, and he went and nailed it to the castle church there in Wittenberg, Germany, to get some attention to the things that he thought the Roman Catholic Church needed to draw attention to. He was not in any way at that point trying to reform the Roman Catholic Church, or, or to leave the Roman Catholic Church. He was wanting to reform what was happening there, but he had no intent at that point of starting his own church. He just wanted some attention drawn to these things, especially that he had noted that because he had been reading the Bible, he he was a scholar, he had a he had a doctoral uh, a doctorate in theology. He was someone well educated and was examining the Bible in light of this and what was being taught uh, and what he was involved in. Roman Catholic Church said there's some things we need to investigate here, but he wasn't looking to start his own church. But he did get the attention that he wanted by nailing these to the to the door there, and, and, and probably the thing that just drove him to this point was the sale of, indulg- of indulgences. As the Roman Catholic Church was trying to raise funds for uh, the, uh, the, the, the construction and, and all that was going on with, uh, with St. Peter's at that time, well, it was easy to, to make some sales of these indulgences for people to be able to, well, to, uh, in, in, in a in a way of looking at it, to be able to sin and have a get-out-of-jail-free card when they do it. Martin Luther looked at that and said, this isn't right. And so it prompted him to want to make some changes. Well, after 1517, after October 31st, he got the attention and there were all sorts of conversations, all sorts of trials. He was put on trial. He was asked to disown. He was asked to, to uh, get away from th- those things that he had stated and, pr- and to denounce uh, those things that he had uh, stated in his theses. And he, he just refused to do it. And so on May, 21st, May 25th of 1521, he was banned from the Roman Catholic Church. He was excommunicated. What other choice did he have? but to start meeting on his own and to start, in effect, his own church. With those things that he wanted changed from the Roman Catholic Church, brought into now what he was able to teach teach in his own group and started with a rather sizable following, and it grew from there. Does the Bible have anything to say about something like this? Does the Bible teach us anything in regard to how this particular church got its start? Well, again, we don't have time to investigate everything, but the Bible teaches that the church was not founded by a man, not a mere man. 
The church was founded by Jesus Christ. He said, I will build my church. He purchased the church with his own blood. He is the foundation upon which the church is built in 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 11. In fact, that verse says, there is no other foundation than that which is laid, the man Christ Jesus. And so there was not another church that needed to be founded or started by another man. There was already the Lord's church that was in existence, that came into existence when it was established on the day of Pentecost in AD 33 that we read about in Acts chapter 2. It was not started by a man. It was not started in 1517 or 1521. It was started there in the book of Acts. As we read throughout our New Testament, we learn that there is no human institution, no human man-made institution that could be the New Testament church because Jesus had already established that himself. When we look at the origin of this church, it just doesn't match what we read about in the Bible. Similar to that, we would have to investigate the denominational nature of this church. It not only started as a division, and that's the, the very basis of the word denomination, is that word division. It not only started as a division, but the Lutheran church claims to be a denomination. And in fact, even within the Lutheran church itself, we will see in a little while that there are denominations within the Lutheran church. But the Lutheran church teaches that the church has different branches. They see the, they see the, the global, the universal church as having multiple branches as a part of that church. And, and they, they, they read this and they believe that from John chapter 15. And they just believe that the Lutheran church is one of those branches of the universal church of which there are many branches. In fact, one of the things that they, they are quoted as saying in the Lutheran church is that different branches of the church, think about this, different branches of the church draw different conclusions from the Word of God. Well, what do you think about that statement? Different branches of the church draw different conclusions. Is that the way God designed His church to be? Did God design His church to have different branches? And if He designed it to have different branches, did He design it so that they would all draw different conclusions from the Word of God? What does the Bible teach? The Bible teaches that there is only one church. There's not many. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 4, there is only one body, one church that we are to be a part of. If there is more than one church, then it, then, it, then it goes contrary to what Jesus prayed in John 17 and what Jesus wanted there to be when he purchased that one church. If you investigate John 15, and I would encourage you to investigate the first eight verses of John chapter 15, because this is one of those passages that a number of groups go to, and they claim that these branches that Jesus is talking about, Jesus says, I am the vine and you are the branches. And they claim that these branches are the different branches, offshoots of the church, but these are different denominations that make up the one church. Go back and read John chapter 15. Read what Jesus is saying in this passage and circle as you go through that passage how many times Jesus uses the word in, I in. Those who are these branches are the ones who are in Christ. You can't be one of these branches if you are not in Christ. The Bible tells us that there's one way to get into Christ, Galatians 3, 27, Romans chapter 6, and verse 3, and that is to be baptized into Christ. If someone has not followed God's plan of salvation laid out in order for one to get into Christ, then he is not in Christ, and if he's not in Christ, he is not one of the branches that Jesus talks about in John chapter 15. Jesus identifies these branches as being individual disciples. Go to John chapter 15, look in verse 5, look in verse 8, and more than that, you'll see the word you, Y-O-U. Circle that word, and then draw a line to the word disciples down in verse 8, where Jesus says about these branches, you, if you are in Christ, if you are one of these branches, you are my disciples. Who are the branches? The branches are Jesus' disciples. The disciples are these branches that are connected to the vine, that are in the vine, that are in Christ because they have followed His plan. These aren't different denominations. These are individual disciples that are to grow in Christ and, 
as Jesus talked about in that passage, these branches can be removed from Christ uh, if they, if they uh, fail to continue to follow after Him. But I've got to be His disciple to be a branch. Matthew chapter 15 and verse 13. Jesus said, Every plant which my heavenly Father has not planted is going to be uprooted. That's talking about anyone or any group that would try to plant themselves contrary to the Word of God. The Bible does not produce denominationalism. It just simply doesn't. The Bible produces God's church. It's man's doctrine that would produce some denominational nature with, within a church. Number three. And I almost made this number one, but maybe it's number three. You look at the name of this church. And you have to look at the name of the church in light of what the Bible says. But what is the name of this church? What is this church called? It's called the Lutheran Church. Now, initially... Initially, the word Lutheran was, was a word that was used uh, and, and applied in derision uh, by the Catholics. Oh, those are the, those are the Lutherans. And it was, it, it was derision to say, oh, those people follow Luther. But then it started to stick. And instead of a term of derision, it became something that these followers adopted and accepted. And some of them were proud of it, and some of them determined, well, we, 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 can't, we can't push back against it because we do accept Luther, and we do accept his doctrines, and so we don't want to repudiate this name. And so these are individuals, individual people, and these are groups, congregations, churches, that wear the name of a man named Luther. I don't mean this to be unkind, but if you pick up your Bible... Will you find that name in your Bible? Will you find the name of a person or of a group of people calling themselves after a man named Luther? Or, for that matter, any other human man that's walked the face of the earth besides Jesus Christ? It's just not there. And this name doesn't come along for 1,500 years after Jesus dies upon the cross. What does the Bible say about this? The Bible says that the church belongs to Christ. It doesn't belong to Luther, it belongs to Christ. What name should it wear? It should, name the, it should wear the name of the man who said, I will build my church. It was purchased by Jesus. It wasn't purchased by any other man. And if you just read through the New Testament, there's only three of each of these on, on the screen, and there's more of them as you read through the New Testament, but just read through the New Testament. What was the church called in the New Testament? It was never given a name. It was, it, it was, there were various designations that were used for it, various descriptions used for it, but there was never a name given to it. Oh, it's called the Church of Christ, the Church of God, Church of the Living God, the Body of Christ, the Kingdom of Christ. It's, it's called, but it's never said, here's a name for it. Here were some descriptions, depictions for it. And what about those who were a part of it? Well, they weren't called Lutherans. They weren't called after any other denominational group. They were called Christians, following after Christ. They were, they were called saints. They were called disciples. They were called brethren. They were called the sheep, if you want a, a figurative term. But think about what the Bible said that these individuals were called. The passage that was read from 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 11 and 12, I think is key to this particular topic. Where Paul said, I have heard a report about what's happening there, that the New King James says that there are contentions among you. And he says, here's what's happening in verse 12. Some are saying, I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, I am of Cephas. If this was put in the 21st century, could it be said that there might be somebody saying, I am of Luther? And it be any different than some of these others that are mentioned? If I'm following after another man, is that what God calls me to do? And that's why he says, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Was Luther crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul, Cephas, Apollos, or some other man? If you look at the name of this church, the Bible says in Acts chapter 4 and verse 12, there's salvation in no other. 
There's no other name given among men un under heaven whereby we must be saved. There is no other name other than Christ that the church ought to wear or be known as than the one who founded it. That's something that we've got to investigate. It's interesting, it's interesting to go back and look at what Martin Luther himself said. Listen, listen to this quote from Martin Luther. Martin Luther, again, did not want to start his own church. That was not his original intent. And when it came down to it, and, 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 and this was kind of, in, in, in his mind, thrust upon him, and as he started down this road, he did not want this to be a Lutheran church. Listen to this quote from Martin Luther. He says, I pray you leave my name alone, and not to call yourselves Lutherans, but Christians. Who is Luther? My doctrine is not mine. I have not been crucified for anyone. How does it then benefit me, a miserable bag of dust and ashes, to give my name to the children of Christ? Cease, my dear friends, to cling to these party names and distinctions. Away with all of them, and let us call ourselves only Christians, after him from whom our doctrine comes. Hello. The man had it. He understood it. He wanted it. Unfortunately, after his death, that's not what his followers did. And yet here's a man who understood what the name of the church should be, coming after the one who died for it. Think if we were going to investigate this, number four. We would have to look at the creed of the church. And that word creed may not be very familiar to some of us. But the Lutheran church basically holds to nine different creeds. I want you to think about that, nine different creeds. Luther himself initially held to the three ecumenical, the general creeds that, that most denominations today would even hold to. The, they were creeds that were written in the fourth century. Not the first century, that would be the Bible. But these were written in the fourth century, some creeds. And, and Luther defined a creed as, here's a statement of what we believe and what we practice. That's what a creed is, that's how Luther defined it himself. So Luther held to the, uh, the, the, uh, the Nicene Creed, the Apostles' Creed, and the Athanasian Creed. That, those were the three basic creeds that he held to. But then he's, then he's banned from the Catholic Church in 1521, begins his own group, as it were. And so in 1529, Luther wrote his own creeds. He wrote his own catechisms. 1529, he wrote his small cate what's called his small catechism, and then one that's called his large catechism. And you can probably figure out what the difference is. They're essentially the same. The small is just a little bit easier to understand. Then in the next year, his, his colleague and, and really his successor, uh, a man by the name of Philip uh, Melanchthon, wrote what was called the Augsburg Confession. And uh, the L Lutherans today will only hold to what they consider the unadultered Augsburg Confession. There's been others. But this was, this was Melanchthon putting into writing uh, Luther's statement of faith. Then the next year, Melanchthon wrote the Apology. Not apologizing for, it's not being sorry, but it's a defense for what he had written the year before in the Augsburg Confession. Another statement of their faith. Then in 1537, Luther wrote uh, the Schmackal Articles, which were again a summary of his doctrines, listing kind of his confession of faith in that. And then it was after his death in 1577 that uh, a, uh, a document called the Formula of Concord was written, and this was the most comprehensive of Lutheran doctrine, explaining his theology, uh, gathering everything together. And then in 1580, they, they, they took the Formula of Concord and they said, all right, let's take that, and then they, then they said, let's take these other Lutheran documents and let's put all of them together in 1580 in, the, in this book of Concord. And, and this has become kind of the standard for Lutherans today. It, it contains their basic creeds and confessions, defines the Lutheran belief uh, for others in, in, in a kind of an all-comprehensive place to go. As I understand it, those who are confirmed into the Lutheran church are given a copy of Luther's uh, small catechism. And I, I didn't bring that in here, and I didn't bring in the book by, by, a name, book by the name of a man by W.E. Schramm, uh, who wrote a book called What Lutherans Believe. And those two documents are presented to someone who's confirmed into the Lutheran church. I studied with a lady a while back who was raised 
Lutheran church and she told me about their Sunday school when she was a child. Told me about going to Sunday school at the Lutheran church and how they would go to Bible class with the children and, well, they weren't taught from the Bible in their Bible class. But they got Luther's small catechism out. And really, Luther's small catechism was written for this purpose. It's written in a question-answer format. And they were taught from Luther's catechism in their Sunday school class. And her remembrance was it wasn't from the Bible. What does God say about creeds? Does God say anything about creeds? The Bible teaches that it is all sufficient. That it doesn't say it's not just inspired of God in 2 Timothy 3 and verse 16, but that it supplies, that, that it thoroughly furnishes us, verse 17, thoroughly. What does that word mean? You, is there anything lacking? It thoroughly furnishes us unto every good work. 2 Peter 1 and verse 3, it supplies us with everything uh, that pertains unto life and godliness. Here is a book that the Bible says is all sufficient for everything that we need. Does that, do, do we need anything else once we've got the Bible? Here's something that the Bible says has been once for all delivered. It provides us with everything the saints need to teach and defend to the truth. It's not to be added to, taken away from, modified, subtract, uh, substituted for, or, or anything done to it. And so sometimes we get, we get uh, occasionally we've got messages, uh, emails into the office. Can you please provide your statement of faith, please? Why don't you have a statement of faith on your website? Well, what's a statement of faith? A statement of faith is a creed. To form of a creed that says, here's what this church believes. Well, if we have a creed, if we have a statement of faith on our website that says, here's what we believe, what if it doesn't say everything the Bible says? Well, it doesn't say enough. What if it says more than what the Bible says? Well, then it says too much. What if you put a creed or a statement of faith on your website that says exactly what the Bible says? Then you don't need the creed or the statement of faith because you've already got the Bible for that. Lutherans believe that the catechism were written so that they would be able to understand the Bible. And then Schramm's book on what Lutherans believe was written so that they could understand the catechisms so that they could then understand the Bible. Do you know that God gave you the Bible so that you could understand the Bible? And that's how God intends for us to understand what His truth is. It's to just come to the Bible and let the Bible teach us without any addition or subtraction. Very briefly, let me talk about its organization. The organizational structure of the Lutheran Church follows after a, a synod uh, organizational structure. And that, again, that may not be a word that's familiar to us. But basically, the Lutheran congregations give allegiance to various uh, and differing synods or denominations, not outside of Lutheran, Lutheranism, but within Lutheranism, there are various synods and various denominations within the Lutheran church. Uh, at one time in the U.S., there were 150 different Lutheran branches, denominations, synods, uh, groupings, within the U.S. Uh, that has since apparently uh, been brought down, and as best as I can figure, there are a little over 40 different Lutheran denominations in North America right now. Um, and depending on, depending on what source you go to, those can kind of be summarized, and those are kind of condensed into four major denominations within Lutheran uh, within the Lutheran doctrine. Now, I've got or three or two on the screen because, again, it depends on what source you go to to see what they, the, the primary two Lutheran uh, denominations are the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, which is abbreviated ELCA, or the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, which is uh, uh, abbreviated LCMS, or they have a couple others. And, uh, again, it depends on how you divide it. But within the Lutheran church, there are these different denominations. And so each individual congregation of a Lutheran church would devote itself to one of these denominations, whichever one they felt closest to, whichever one they wanted to feel like they wanted to be associated with, or whichever one they thought that their doctrines aligned with better. So it could be one of two, one of three, one of four, or it could be one of 40. 
But between a congregation and the major denominational groups within Lutheranism, there are, there are synods in between that handle the various regions. And so these various regional synods deal with the individual congregations, and then these regional synods, then they have these annual meetings, conferences that answer to the major synod or the major denomination. So is, is that the way that God set up His church to have that kind of organizational structure? When we pick up the Bible, the Bible doesn't mention anything about synods. doesn't mention anything about conventions or having annual uh, conferences, uh, uh, particularly at which these, uh, these denominations make various rulings and decisions and pass those down through their various hierarchical structures to their congregations. The Bible doesn't depict that kind of thing. The Bible says that congregations of the New Testament church are autonomous. It means that they're, they're, that they're self-governing. They have Christ as the head of the church, not some man. He's the one who has all authority. The Bible teaches that every local congregation is subject to the same universal law. They don't have different laws. They don't have different doctrines. They are governed by the same universal law. What did Paul say? The verse that was read, 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 10. I plead with you, brethren, by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak different things. No. You all speak mostly the same thing. Get it close. No. All speak the same thing. And that there be no divisions among you. That's what God wanted. No divisions. Well, how do you accomplish that? By all teaching the same thing. Here, here we are reading 1 Corinthians where there was division. I am of Paul. I am of Cephas. I am of Paulus. I am of Christ. There's division in that church. And so here's a book that funnels in, focuses in on that doctrine that says don't be divided. Read it from beginning to end and look how often Paul says, as I taught this, I taught it in every church. God's not the author of confusion in chapter 14 and verse 33. But he, he's the author of peace. God didn't bring about the confusion that exists in the religious world. Well, where did it come from? Oh, it didn't come from God. Each congregation is independent. They have, there's no authority of an individual or a body outside of a local congregation. That doesn't exist. But Paul went everywhere appointing elders in every church. And that was, that was it. Every church was to have its own eldership, but there was no authority, there was no synod, there was no hierarchical structure, there was no uh, leadership of that congregation outside the local congregation. That's how God set it up to be for those men who are elders to be overseers, but among that congregation and among that congregation only. As we examine these things, we've got to come back and say, what did God want for His church and we see that there are some differences here. Very briefly, I want to talk about the doctrine of faith only that is very prevalent within the Lutheran church. The Lutheran church teaches very boldly, and this is, this is one of their, their central primary doctrines, is that justification is by faith alone. And where this really came, uh, especially came into light, was Luther's reaction against the Catholic church. And Luther's reaction against the Catholic church focused at least in his mind, their focus on works and this idea of indulgences and all of that. And so he reacted against their emphasis on works and said, no, justification is by faith. And it's not just by faith. The Bible teaches justification is by faith. But when he came to Romans 1 and verse 17, he saw the word faith. When he came to Romans 3 and verse 28, he saw the word faith. When he came to Romans 5 and verse 1, he saw the word faith. And when he began translating, again, he was a very scholarly man, when he began translating the, his own New Testament from Greek into the German language, instead of it saying that justification is by faith, he just inserted for us the English word alone. That's what he taught. That's what he inserted, or wanted at least to insert into his translation. And so as his followers have come along, they have adopted that same doctrine. Well, obviously, that says a little bit different than what the book of James says. James chapter 2 talks about works and how faith without works is dead. Well, Martin Luther didn't like the book of James. He called it an epistle of straw. He did not believe that it should even be in the New Testament. As he began translating his own New Testament, his intent was to leave the book of James out 
of his version of the New Testament. Why? Well, because it, it wasn't be, because, well, it wasn't because he thought there was evidence that it wasn't inspired of God. It was because he didn't agree with what was there in its teaching. Well, what does the Bible teach? The Bible teaches that faith saves. The Bible absolutely teaches faith saves. At the same time, the Bible teaches that works save. Is that a contradiction? No, that's not a contradiction. Can one save and they both save at the same time? Well, certainly. The Bible says that our faith saves us by our works. It teaches, number three, that faith alone cannot save. Read James chapter 2. We don't have time to look at all these verses. But read James chapter 2. Faith without works is dead. He begins this whole section in James chapter 2 and verse 14 by saying, Can faith save this man? As if to say, if that's all he's got, can faith save him? It can't save him. It's not works of the law of Moses, and that's where they sometimes get confused. Romans 3 and verse 28 is talking about the works of the law of Moses. Well, of course those can't save us. That's the law of Moses. But it's not works of, of meritorious works. It's not works that I can boast of and say, hey, look at me. Look, God, at all of I have done. Well, those works aren't going to save you, and that's what Paul is talking about in Ephesians 2 and verse 8. But in James 2, James is not talking about works of the law of Moses. He's not talking about meritorious works that I could boast of. He's talking about works that are coupled together with our faith. And by faith, all of those things are made perfect. You can't be saved by one without the other. And that's what Scripture teaches. We've got to do the will of God and be obedient to the faith in order to be saved. When you and I stand there on the day of judgment... We are going to be judged, the Bible says, by our works. That's what the Bible says about our relationship with God and how we become justified in the eyes of God. And obviously there's a lot more that we could say about all of this. But when you begin to compare the doctrine of this church and what the Bible teaches, well, they, they don't match up. Number seven think we would have to investigate the practice of infant baptism. The Lutheran Church teaches that infants are proper subjects for baptism for a number of reasons. One, they look at what Jesus says when Jesus said, let the children come unto me. And so since Jesus said, let the children come unto me, the Lutherans say, the only way that you can come unto Jesus is to be baptized. So to come unto Jesus, you've got to be baptized. And he says, let the children come to me, so we've got to baptize the children. So that's one way they say you've got to baptize children. They look at the, the accounts of households in the book of Acts being baptized, and they say, look there, the infants of those households must have been baptized as well. And then they look at the, uh, the matter of circumcision of the Old Testament, and they say that today baptism is the modern-day circumcision, that baptism has taken the place of circumcision, and that's how babies... Enter, that's how babies entered into a covenant with God in the Old Testament. So baptism is how babies enter into a covenant with God today. What does the Bible say? The Bible teaches that baptism is preceded by hearing the gospel, by believing the gospel, by repenting of personal sin, and by confessing faith in Jesus. Which of these can infants do before they are baptized? If you can keep them awake long enough, I suppose that they could hear it for a while. But believe it and repent and confess. This is what the Bible says must precede Bible baptism. But infants are incapable of doing those things. The Bible says that the purpose of baptism in Acts 2 and verse 38 is for the remission of sins. We're going to talk more about that in just a minute. But infants don't have any sins. They have not committed any sins. They don't have a need for the remission of sins. Therefore, they don't have a need to be baptized. We do not have one single example in Scripture of an infant being baptized. And they say, well, look at the households. You don't know who's in somebody's household. I look at the Phil and Mary Porter household. You say, well, Phil and Mary Porter's household, was they were all baptized. Phil, you got any infants in your household? Thank the Lord for that. Phil and Mary don't have any don't have any infants. We look at the Richard and Debbie Watts. You pick, is every household have infants in it? When you read about these households, there's no indication. 
There's no, there's no explicit statement that they had households. So it is, it, is a, it is a misuse of Scripture to force into those verses that there were infants in those homes when the Bible doesn't say that there were. And if there were infants that were baptized there, it contradicts everything else the Bible says about those individuals and what they need to do in order to be baptized. The matter of circumcision uh, and, and their claim that circumcision is, or, or that baptism for babies is the new circumcision. Circumcision of the Old Testament was certainly a, a shadow, was a type of things that would follow in the New Testament. But it, but it was a shadow of what was to come when, when one it has, has their heart circumcised. When you read Colossians chapter 2 and verse 11 and 12 and, and the discussion there about baptism, it talks about ha how one has the fleshly part of him, his fleshly desires circumcised. He, that, that, that's, that, that is, he puts off the body of the sins of the flesh, Colossians chapter 2 and verse 1. When does somebody do that? They put off the body of sins of the flesh. Does that have anything to do with repentance? Repentance is when you change your mind about sin. I want to stop doing what's wrong and start doing what's right. I've, I, I've said to sin, I don't want you anymore. And then I'm baptized, and what happens when I'm baptized? All sins are removed from me. Is it possible that there is a depiction there about some sort of uh, uh, them being removed? Well, certainly, and it's by the hand of God that does it. But it was just baby boys that were circumcised in the Old Testament, right? Where would be the authority for baptizing a baby girl today? If baptism today is just circumcision of the Old Testament, then how could you baptize a baby girl? That, that, that wouldn't follow. You would only be able to baptize baby boys, uh, but that, that's not even it because baptism is not a modern version of circumcision. It is just a figurative way of looking at what happens to the fleshly part of us and our sins that is removed when we repent and are baptized. As we consider number eight, this matter of total depravity. Lutheran Church teaches that infants are born in sin. They teach that when a baby comes into this world, they have inherited the sin of their mother and the father and generations before. They have inherited the sin of Adam. And so having been born, they already have sin. And so they are totally deprived in the eyes of God. They're, con they're condemned because of that sin in the sight of God. They're separated from God because of the sin that they have inherited. And so that's why they teach infant baptism. That, ba that babies need to be baptized in order to have that sin removed. But what does the Bible say? The Bible teaches that sin is the result of a person's own desires. In James chapter 1 and verse 14, it says, Each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Hear that. Each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. So the temptation... To sin involves your own desires and not that of anyone else. And then it says, when desire has conceived, your own desires, when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. Where does sin come from? It comes from giving into temptations. Whose temptations? Your own temptations. Sin is a result of one's own desires. It is a personal choice. He who commits sin is something he does on his own in 1 John 3 and verse 4. Sin is not inherited. We mentioned this verse a couple weeks ago in another lesson in Ezekiel chapter 18 and verse 20, that the son will not bear the guilt of the father. Sin is not inherited through the flesh as they would teach. If it is, what about baby Jesus? The Bible says he was born of the flesh. The Bible says that he took on flesh. The Bible says he became flesh and dwelt among us, John 1 and verse 14. What about Jesus? Was he born was he born with sin? And then in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10, the Bible says that what we are going to be judged by are our own sins. If a baby dies, is a baby going to be condemned in the eyes of God? Is a baby going to be sent to hell by God because of sins that that baby has inherited? Listen to 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10. We must all appear, be, who? All of us. Does that include babies too? We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. That each one, that's all of us, each one may receive the things done in the body. 
whether they be good or whether they be evil. What am I going to be judged by? By what I do in my body. Not by what you do in your body or what my, what my parents did in their bodies or what my Adam did in his body. I'm going to be judged by what I do in my body and that's going to be the same thing for a little baby. It's going to be judged by what that baby, did, what sin has a baby committed. Not a single solitary one. They are perfectly sinless in the eyes of God. Number nine, We've got to look at the doctrine of the Ten Commandments and how they teach that the Ten Commandments are still binding. Lutheran Church teaches that the moral law, and these are their words, the moral law sets forth our duties to God and man. Somebody says, well, what's the moral law? Well, here's how they define the moral law. They say the moral law is the Ten Commandments, and they say that is binding on all men today. And so when you pick up Luther's small catechism, he has a whole section on the Ten Commandments. Uh, you may go and investigate that sometime because while they have ten, they don't number them the same that we do. Uh, they don't have what we would have as number two. Number two, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven images. That's not on their Ten Commandments. Uh, it's not on the Catholics' Ten Commandments either. Uh, they have a different ten. But what they say about the Ten Commandments is that these are still binding on us today. And then they violate that because they don't keep the Sabbath. Isn't that interesting? These are still binding on us, but they don't keep the Sabbath. Well, they get around that because they say that Sunday is the Christian Sabbath. What does the Bible say? The Bible teaches that the Ten Commandments were a part of the covenant that God made with the Jews at Mount Sinai. If you have not circled Deuteronomy 4 and verse 13 and Deuteronomy 5 verses 1 and 2 in your Bible, you need to do that. You need to know those verses. And, and along with the Exodus chapter 34 and those verses in 1 Kings chapter 9 and, and draw a circle around verse 9 and verse 21 and connect those with a line because the covenant the includes the Ten Commandments. God didn't have a, a ceremonial law and a moral law and it didn't separate those. They were all one and they were all taken away in the cross. They, they are not separated by God anywhere. Man has tried to separate the Ten Commandments out. But they were all a part of the law that God, that Jesus removed in the cross. That was a part of God's original law, but it was made only with the Jews at Mount Sinai. Were you at Mount Sinai? Are you a Jew? If the answer to the, either one of those is no, then we're not bound by the Old Testament today. And even if you could say yes, you're still not bound by the Old Testament today. Because Jesus took it out of the way. Colossians 2 and verse 14 says, having nailed it to his cross. How do we know Colossians 2 and verse 14 is that Old Testament being taken out of the way? Because verse 16 says, it's that law that included things about the new moon and the Sabbaths and the festivals. That's the old law that was nailed to the cross. The old law tells us plainly that the Sabbath was the seventh day. Read these verses from the book of Exodus that are on the screen. It's as plain as day that the Sabbath was not the first day. The Sabbath was the seventh day. God defined it clear as day in these verses that it's the seventh day. But when you come to the new covenant, not the old covenant, when you come to the new covenant, the Lord's day is the first day of the week. We had read to us tonight from Acts chapter 20 and verse 7. When Paul came to Troas, he came there. The disciples were gathered together on the first day of the week. And nowhere in the New Testament is that ever called the Christian Sabbath. Finally, we would have to investigate the doctrine of consubstantiation. And this may not be a word that's familiar to you. We've probably heard about the word transubstantiation, which is the Catholic doctrine that we investigated back in January. But Luther did not follow after the transubstantiation doctrine, which said in the communion uh, that the emblems become the body. They become the blood of Jesus, as transubstantiation would teach. But Luther's uh, doctrine used the terminology that the body and the blood of Jesus is with and under the emblems. As they are 
as they are uh, blessed, as they are prayed for, that the body and the blood of Jesus is with, these are their words, they are literally with and under the bread and the cup uh, as we partake. Uh, that, that's, that the body of Jesus, the blood of Jesus is there. Is that what the Bible teaches? The Bible teaches that the body and the blood of Jesus are separate from the emblems that we partake of. There's a number of things we could discuss here, but think about when Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper. He took the bread. He took the what? He took the bread. What was it that he had in his hand? bread and he said this is my body where is Jesus's literal body is looking right at him in the eye his literal body is holding a literal piece of bread and he says this literal piece of bread being held by my literal body is my body Jesus that can't be your literal body you got the idea it's not his literal body Figuratively, he says, this bread is my body. This cup is my blood. Was Jesus being literal in that sense? No. And isn't it inter interesting that when Paul quotes this, some 30 years later, when he's writing 1 Corinthians chapter 11, he uses those same words to depict that Jesus was saying, this is my body and this is my blood, and it hadn't changed. It's still the same bread and still the same cup. Did Jesus use figurative language? Jesus said, I am the door. Hmm. Was he metal? Was Jesus wooden? Was he a stone door? Was he a fiberglass door? What kind of door was Jesus? Figuratively, I am the door to the sheep. When Jesus says, I am the vine, that used to bother me when I was a kid. I am allergic fiercely to poison ivy. If I look at it, I get it. And I, that, that's not much of an exaggeration. I can't stand it. I stay as far away from it as I can. When I read Jesus saying, I am the vine, that bothered me as a kid. I don't like vines. Stay away from me. What is Jesus saying? Is he saying he's a literal vine? Of course not. I am the vine, you are the branches that are in me. He is figuratively, figuratively depicting a relationship that man could understand. This is my body, figuratively. Can we understand that? It is a memorial. We are not having the literal body of Jesus in, the, in, this, in some kind of a material reenactment in, a, in the serving and the partaking. It's a memorial. Simply help us to remember what Jesus did for us on the cross. Are there good, moral people in the Lutheran church? Of course there are. Are there devout people in the Lutheran church? Of course there are. Are there sincere people in the Lutheran church? Absolutely. Are there people in the Lutheran church who stand up for moral principles and righteous living? Of course there are. Not trying to be unfair to anybody tonight. Not trying to be unkind to anybody tonight. Trying to investigate what does the Bible say. And can we understand the Bible in such a way that we can investigate others? The Bible says to test all things. Does that include... Does that include other religions? The Bible says, that's in 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 21. The Bible says in 1 John, 5 and, or 1 John 4 and verse 1 to test all teachers, test all spirits. Test everything that you hear. Where's the test? Where's the measure? Where's the standard? We've got to come back to God's Word. May God help us to be humble. May God help us to be honest in our approach to His Word, may God help us not to be haughty, to think we've got it all figured out. If you think you got it all figured out, hmm, there might be something waiting you that uh, might be tripping you up one day. Nobody's got it all figured out. But with God's help, 
Jesus has got it all figured out. And he shares with us in his word the path that he wants us to go. If you have any questions tonight about what's been said, or if you think in any way that this has not been a fair treatment uh, of, what is, uh, of, what, of what they teach, then please share that with me, and I would be happy to hear you in regard to that. You know, the Bible teaches that there's one church. It's the church that Jesus established in the New Testament. The question tonight, are you a part of His church? Not a church that a man started, but a church that Jesus started and purchased with His own blood. Are you a part of that church? In order to become a part of it, we've already talked about it tonight, you need to believe that Jesus is God's Son. To repent of sins and the wrong that's in your life, make up your mind, you want to stop doing what's wrong, Start doing what's right. Confess the faith that's in your heart. This night, you can be baptized. Just like James Green was about four or five hours ago, you can be baptized today for the remission of your sins and let God add you to His church. Wash away your sins and add you to the book of life. If you want to do that tonight, why don't you respond right now as together we stand and sing.